Hi everyone, this is Jason. Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Jeremy Cox. You know him on Twitter as CryptoCypto. We're going to be discussing Bitcoin, blockchain, and wine as we look at how blockchain technology can aid in the fight against wine forgery. Before we begin, please take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you're notified whenever I upload a new video. Thank you. Now on with our show. You know, uh, before we get started, the, the big thing here is um, uh, the ultimate goal for me and the reason I got into crypto in the first place is because I want to own a winery. Mm. And it's my intention that, you know, the only, I have to have $50 million in my pocket before I can go go shopping for the winery. Right. And the whole notion that it's like, you know, you're not going to get rich. I'm, you're not going to become wealthy uh, working. Like mm -hmm. your wealth is built by investing. And mm -hmm. when I really started to chunk away at like, okay, well, what, what do I invest in? How did, you know, how would it even work? And my financial advisor had scared me out of the stock market like two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I, and I was cursing him up until about two weeks ago. <laughs> that right. was like, how is it like, it's the, the stock market's the highest it's ever been. And you know, I moved my stuff into an annuity, right. but uh, I protected it from exactly what's happening right now. And yeah. so uh, but even after I did that, then I was like, you know, now I kind of want to dabble and, and get involved in it a little bit. And he's like, don't, don't get in the stock market. Yeah. So crypto kind of found me and it was that whole notion of, uh, I know you always ask people like, you know, what, you know, what, how did you, what's your background and where'd you get started in it? Right. My initial searching or like doing the research, the moment that I found the blockchain, I was like, wait a second, what is this? And I, I was uh, initially looking for um, my entry into Bitcoin from a mining perspective because mm -hmm. I'd heard, oh, you know, just set up your computer and mine Bitcoin. And then I searched it and it's like, oh, yeah, at this point, it's your unless you have like a, you know, um, a warehouse and you can buy like 50 miners and having them run 24 seven, you're out of the game because you can't compete with the Chinese uh, mining farms. Right. And I was like, OK, never mind. But. I got more and more like, you know, that rabbit hole deeper down the rabbit hole of crypto. That it's like, this is such an interesting space. Mm -hmm. And first and foremost, it's the technology that's just, it gets me. And when I read the Bitcoin standard, that whole notion of like the future of money and that we're in a natural evolution of money. Right. And it's only a matter of time before we're going to switch to being completely digital, you know, and whether well, it is Bitcoin or not, yeah, and that and that's true because for a lot of us, I think a lot of us first got into the space because of the money aspect. You know, the mm -hmm. idea that you could have something that accrues. I mean, this is this is beyond accrue interest. I mean, you could literally go from ten dollars to forty dollars overnight during some of these highs and lows. <laughs> yeah. Without right? question, right? Yeah. But at the same time, I think a lot of people got scared out because of the money too because when that 2017 crash happened a lot of people weren't were were just their mind was just blown when you could see that it could go from upwards of 20,000 down to i think it was 7,000 when the, when it finally bottomed out yeah and yeah. a lot of people can't deal with that you know it, it it's it's a big you know like a, a shock to the system when you see that yeah. because traditional stocks don't do that you know, and unfortunately, it added to the whole, this stuff is too volatile, or this stuff is risky, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but for those of us who stayed, like you and I, I think we, we were able to look past the financial part and go to the technology side, yeah. and see that there's a future here. You know, yeah. That's uh, that's the, the biggest thing. So for me, it was uh, I bought in in September of 18 and I was like, OK, I'm in. My first Bitcoin purchase was at uh, right around sixty five hundred. Okay. I was like, oh, this is great. And then November, the having or not the having, but the hard fork for uh, uh, Satoshi's vision hit. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I woke up and it's like it went from sixty six thousand to like four thousand yeah. down to thirty one hundred. And I was like whoa and people that i'd already kind of like you know talked to about bitcoin and i was like no this is this is going to be great you guys should buy like i'm doing i'm buying at that point i was doing a hundred dollars at a time on coinbase mm -hmm. and um 
then you know the people that were watching were like what just happened to bitcoin they're like it went down so fast and blah 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 i'm like yeah that's that's what you have to you have to be prepared for but it's um the natural again you know anything volatile like this and i did some studying in the forex mm -hmm. and the the forex markets are it's it it similar uh in the 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 moves that can happen so quickly right. and literally wipe people out and the conversations that i had with people that had gotten into bitcoin because somebody told them in 2017 this is it you know here's your chance and they sunk you know 10 or twenty thousand dollars in at the top yep. and it's the funniest thing because it's like first and foremost it's like you're obviously you don't you haven't done any research on investing because you never get in at the top of anything you kind of want to you know test the waters and why would and even back then if i was getting into it i would have i can't say i would have from the very beginning but the cost averaging thing really speaks to me it makes so much sense right and the whole thing of like you know buying the dips every time that i see it move more than like 500 bucks down I'm like, all right, I'm going to buy another another $25 worth or what have you. Right. And now it's oh. all with Cash App. And now the the interesting thing about, about what we're talking about right now is that you and I both know you never buy the top. I mean, and before we continue, this is not financial advice. We're not telling you to do anything, yada, yada, yada. But you don't buy the top. <laughs> yep. And, but... In, in playing devil's advocate to the layman, the new person who may have first got into Bitcoin in 2017, the way that Bitcoin is being pumped on social media and in the news, they didn't think 20,000 was the top. They thought it was going to become some astronomical number. Yeah. Right. And because and even now you have people talking about 200,000. Right. Yeah. So you, you have no nothing to back up that claim except. I have no idea what they're using to say that particular number, which yeah. is, you know, so if you listen to that, you would think we're nowhere near the top. So I'm safe with buying in at this price, but you don't know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and the person telling you that has no proof of it. So it's like, well, how how do you how do you gauge it you know and and you know like when i tell people about getting into bitcoin the first thing i usually get as a response is do i need to buy it at that price right yeah. so like right now bitcoin's just south of eight thousand dollars a coin mm -hmm. all right btc and you know so for a person who thinks you have to buy that or pay that to have a Bitcoin. They don't know about Satoshis and that the a Bitcoin is divisible and you can buy chunks of it, right? Yeah. Um, they might think I need to pay that much money. And then when it yep. drops down to six, now they're looking at you crazy because <laughs> you don't, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, that was the thing. Like when I first got into it and even talk, even trying to explain to people the whole like, 100 million Satoshi equals one Bitcoin and you can buy $10 worth or what have you. I was talking to people about that. And then literally the moment it was down, it's like, God, you must've lost a lot of money. Wow. Right. It's like, yeah, I lost about a dollar. You know, right. like, <laughs> you know? and, and that, that whole notion of, I, I think the bigger picture is that people are money stupid and it sucks to say that it's really sad that, you know, are, are foolish and, and head in the sand about money. Right. But it's not their fault because I believe it's a program and we're, we're taught, we're taught that you don't talk about three things and it's like taboo. You don't talk about religion. You don't talk about politics and you don't talk about money. The exactly. third one, the money part is probably the most important one in my opinion, because coming from the food service industry, I cannot tell you how many private events that I've been in that have been um, with, with very wealthy people. And that's like all that they talk about. Mm -hmm. What's your net worth? What are you investing in? Do you have any tips for me? Blah, you know, it's these things of like, it's, all, it's like a circle. And to, to bring wine into it, that was one of the things that got me into wine in the first place. I was like, oh, wow, wine is like a language of money and of business. If you understand how to talk about wine, you make friends with people almost immediately. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, which wines do you drink? What's your favorite style? Who's your favorite winemaker? Blah, blah. It, it's, it's another rabbit hole. Right. And as it pertains to money, 
it's funny to kind of watch how I can flip people with a very like one's a different story. It's like if, if when I find people that are into it, it's uh, it, the, the conversation can get deep really quickly. Mm. But with money, I've had multiple situations where I can feel the hesitation of like, oh, we are, I don't know if we should even be talking about this right now. To all of a sudden, it's like they get comfortable with it, and then it's like, oh. So yeah, ex- ex- tell me more. How how does this whole thing work? What is XRP? There's other cryptocurrencies. It's not just Bitcoin. It's like, yeah, and that's where it starts to get to be very funny too. Is that once you really start studying and understanding it and talking to other people, you realize how many people have no clue what this space is and how it's all kind of evolving. And then the traps too, because I'm also. I believe that we are going to see an altcoin season eventually. Mm -hmm. And there are so many people that speculate that they're going to do exactly what I did when I opened up coin market cap for the first time. And I was like, wait a second, Bitcoin. It's like, I can buy 0.001 Bitcoin for 25 bucks, but I can buy a thousand uh, Tron or a that, you know, or a hundred XRP. And if the, and that was before I understood um, market cap and how many coins were out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's like, I'd rather have that. And if that doubles, I doubled my money as opposed to, you know, buying point again, zero, zero, one Bitcoin. And if it doubles, I, I, I went from 10 to 20, right. you know, right. but doubling 25 cents to 50 cents is if I have a hundred of them, that's going to be amazing. Again. <laughs> All right. That's good. Yeah. Before yeah. you get, you know, the thing and going back to the, the, um, one of, I, I was the first time I heard Bitcoin's, um, uh, what's the word, the um, prediction of a million dollars. I laughed. I was like, yeah, you got to be kidding me. A million dollar Bitcoin, right? <laughs> yeah, but I can't remember if it was in the, I think it was actually in Life After Google. There's a really fun book by George Gilder that I think that I read a lot. So I can't remember if it was in that or not, but it kind of broke down what, a million dollar Bitcoin looks at looks like, and a million dollar Bitcoin is one cent per Satoshi. And when you get there, because a hundred million Satoshi equals one Bitcoin, a hundred million pennies is a million dollars. So when you get to the idea that if the powers that be, and I'm going to get conspiratorial for one second, that I also somewhat believe I've got like my 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 big toe in a pool of. Satoshi Nakamoto could very well be the central banks mm-hmm. that the central that to get the cypherpunk libertarian movement out to the population to the to the masses that are going to adopt it and be like this is going to this is going to overthrow the banks and this is going to be the way that we're going to take back the power of our money to having it set up it from the very get go that at some point a million dollar Bitcoin would make it to where if you go into the store to buy a loaf of bread that was $2.99, it's now 299 Satoshi. Mm. And it makes, that's where it starts to get like, okay, I can see where, because these aren't stupid people that are like, Bitcoin's going to be a million dollars at some point. Yeah. But it sounds, 200,000 sounds crazy. It sounds astronomical, you know? You know, and to that point, that actually, that's actually a good point that you make about the Satoshi being the central bank. Because, what was it, last year, there was a report that came out that said the crash was orchestrated by the Fed. And that makes sense into what you're saying, because the only way you could orchestrate a crash is if you controlled a large sum of Bitcoin. Yeah. Right? It, it's, it, it's, it, that in itself, thinking that right there will throw what can throw you down a rabbit hole that would scare the crap out of you as far as like you know are we being manipulated you know but Mm -hmm. at the same time it's kind of like the moment that i really bought into that it's like bitcoin's not going to fail it will become the digital gold it will be a store of value and it's just a matter of time before it's like when they decide to flip the switch and be like oh guess what because another thing that's that has always fascinated me about the world of Bitcoin is it's very early on when you're studying it, that you come across Bitcoin is, is illicit money. It's like how, how people buy drugs and the silk road and all this stuff, right? Right. Bitcoin in all its pure form, except I did just hear something that I need to learn a little bit more about, about the, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a, it's kind of like wiping where the, the transactions are 
a little, they're like anonymized or uh, like they're made anonymous to an extent, mixing. but I'm mixing. There you go. Mixing. But the whole thing about it is that if you dig deep enough in the world of electro or of digital media, mm -hmm. everything has signatures. Yes. Your wallet address is, is recorded at some point. The amount that you sent is recorded. Your IP address, where you sent it from. And it's, unless you're really, really smart, and again, stupid people with, with money, uh, they don't care. They're, gonna, they're, they're not going to be like looking for the Moneros or the privacy coins that they can actually use so that they're anonymous. Mm -hmm. They're going to buy in Bitcoin. They're going to be like, how did you know? The whole thing that's happening in China right now with WeChat the whole reason that that's all uh, uh, being implemented is because the Chinese are so crazy about controlling their people mm -hmm. that they want to know where every single penny or every single uh, uh, yuan is spent. Right. So it's like if they, if you're on WeChat and you go, again, the first time I heard you can't walk into a 7-Eleven in China and use cash. They won't right. accept they it. They won't take cash. They won't, they yeah. won't take it anymore. Yeah. Because at that point, e even just the, the transaction of like he bought a pack of cigarettes or whatever he bought, the fact that that person was in that 7-Eleven at that time, and then where did they go? Where was the next transaction? And, you know, again, it gets conspiratorial and weird. Well, no, that, that's actually a good point because uh, one of the things, one of the things that I've learned since becoming in since coming into the space is that most of us don't use Bitcoin correctly uh, the way mm. it was intended to be used in the white paper because mm -hmm. there's a whole section in the white paper about using multiple addresses so that your identity is a, at least obscured not necessarily making you anonymous like people think they are but you know if you use the same address for different things it's like using the same password for different websites yeah so eventually yeah. we're going to figure it out you know, yeah. and that's that's I think what a lot of people in this space don't understand. We're using Bitcoin the same way we use our credit cards. And if you go to Seven Eleven, like you say, and swipe your credit card, and then you go around the corner to Barnes and Noble and swipe your credit card, eventually I can figure out a pattern of where you are. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with these addresses. If I keep seeing the same address going to different places, come from the same IP address, I can figure out who that is. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what chain, anal chain analysis is all about. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people don't even think about it. So to mix it again, because I'm crypto sipto and talk about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency and wine. I love your article that you wrote or your blog post about sour grapes oh. and about the idea of the blockchain being important for the wine industry. It's important for any luxury good and, and, and the world of counterfeits. Because I, I mentioned to you about VeChain and VeChain was another one that I initially bought into because I, I, I not only sour grapes, but there's another fun book. If you haven't heard of the billionaire's vinegar, yeah. our local counterpart. Yeah. Is Rudy yeah. Kerr one up in, up in, um, uh, Arcadia, but the bigger fish is, um, Hardy Rodenstock and yeah. Hardy was faking. He has, there's a 1787 Lafitte Rothschild with Thomas Jefferson's initials engraved in the bottle that was sold on auction like 15 years ago to Kip Forbes, Malcolm Forbes' son, for a half a million dollars. Wow. And years later, after the Koch brothers, after Bill, Mr. Collector Koch got involved in it, he's, everybody's speculating. They're like, how is this guy, or questioning, how is this guy coming up with all these bottles of wine? Right. And it turns out when they had, they mass spectrometered and then also did a cesium-137 test, on these wines and figured out nope these are totally fake bottles that wine that's not 1787 the etching was actually done with a modern uh um like glass etcher mm -hmm. and that's like that's the argument right there for like the current time that i i um, there's another documentary called red obsession that talks about um uh the the influence of wine on china mm -hmm. and they're interviewing christian moyex who is the, the maker of um, Petrus, and okay. Petrus bottles will run you anywhere between one and $4,000, current vintage, right? And um, he's up there and he's like, I, I hate the fact that there's somebody in the world right now that's opening up one of my wines and they're drinking something completely different. It's not Petrus, it's, it's manufactured, it's, a, it's, um, 
it's it's made to kind of taste like Petrus, and that's the other thing about Rudy is that that guy's a master taster. He could taste something one time and recreate it with a blend of different wines. I'm like, dude, the guy's a genius. Right. He yeah, just yeah, went yeah. down the wrong hole, you know, right. or down the wrong road. But when you get into V-chain technology and the idea that you could put a, a chip into the bottle or into a shoe or into a purse, and from the moment that that chip is registered on the blockchain, it is tracking that that item from its inception all the way to the end user, and then once you get into NF, uh, NFTs, the non fungible token side, and, and and the idea of the packet that you could send with it, the the future of projects like VeChain will be once you scan that and verify that it's actually that the winemaker could come up and and you actually get a video. Thank you so much for buying this wine. I hope you love it. This is what we did that year and everything else, as opposed to a static label that might have 200 words on the back. And for French wines, they, they don't even do that. There's like, you know, it's just the import stuff. Well, know? something that, um, because if, okay, everyone, I want to link the, the whole sour grapes thing in the description. This to me, it was just like, the best true life crime caper I had heard about. So yeah. for, and for the people who don't know what happened was this, this gentleman named Rudy, how do you pronounce his last name? Rudy Kerwan. Okay. Kerwan. He, what he was doing was he was going around and he would go to different auctions. He would go to different shows and he would buy the bottle of the, these different expensive wines he wouldn't buy them filled burgundies yes yes. he wouldn't buy them filled he'd just buy the bottle and then he would take it home he would recreate the seal he would uh basically black cauldron up a new (laughs) Mm -hmm. wine and then repackage it now the the how and this is where i got the idea for the the blog post you mentioned about the the blockchain and wine is he was able to take this these bottles to different auction houses and then they would be sold as legitimate and my idea was well why don't we if you use blockchain and please help um if you if you wouldn't mind jeremy chiming in on this one Mm -hmm. if you if you had a crate of 20 and you loaded that information on the blockchain when it got to me as the auction house and there were 25, that should send up red flags because you can't change the information that's on these blockchains. Yeah. Well, right. again, the, the non-fungible token side of it, if each one of those 20 bottles had a token that was associated with it, then you any other wines, it wouldn't, first of all, it wouldn't even be registered. So it's like once you try to go and say, and, and that's a thing in wine, the, the, the more expensive bottles, they know exactly how many bottles are produced. There's no question of like, you know, when you go to the grocery store and you see Kendall Jackson, mm-hmm. there's over a million cases that are produced, I mean, cases, so 12 million bottles that are produced. There's no way to track something like that. But once you get into Petrus, you might be looking at less than 5,000 bottles per vintage, maybe, right. you know? So if each one of those is tokenized and is verified on a blockchain, then the counterfeiters there's how how can you counterfeit how you know can you counterfeit exactly. exactly and it's crazy because i so the even crazier part that was very interesting for me from rudy's perspective is that guy infiltrated the burgundy market before he started faking the bottles he actually increased the price of burgundy because he would go to the auctions before he actually his family had a lot of money yeah. which is the other thing it's so crazy that these people are are there it's sad to me that the wealthiest people in the world it's almost like a um like they have a mental defect, like they need to cope, they need as much money as they can get. They're super successful. And then they find really shady ways to make money. Right. This guy, <laughs> this guy had family money. That's like, he could have been the master of wine and people would have, he was in that documentary. He talks about all of the wines he got to share with his right. friends that are like literally once in a lifetime wines. Right. Yeah. So he's going to the auction market and buying up so much burgundy that it actually affected the price. So when he turned around and sold it, he was actually getting even better price than he would have if he just would have started faking these bottles. The beginning. And yeah, and the same like you were talking about with Rudy, uh, uh, 
the billionaire's vinegar, uh, Hardy Rodenstock, mm-hmm. that guy had somebody traveling with him to all of his tasting events. And he would take the bottles away the moment that they were poured. Mm-hmm. And, and people would ask, it's like, Hey, you know, what's, what are you guys doing with the bottles? It's like, Oh, we're, we just, we, we keep the bottles right. We're you know, what, I don't even remember if I, if I, if it was said what the, the reasoning behind it was, uh-huh. but the reason because was because they were going to take it and refill the wine and sell it again. <laughs> and it's the, it is just asinine that that kind of, you know, that that would even happen, you know? Right. And, and, um, there's a really fun story about a mega tasting that happened in the eighties in Texas that Hardy was uh, um, a part of because they would do the entire library of a first growth. So imagine being invited in, in, in you know, 1984 to some crazy ranch in Texas, three day event where you're going to taste from 1780 all the way up to 19, you know, 1981 uh, uh, or whatever, like the, the current vintage that was done. Right. And you're going to taste them in succession. And where it gets to me is like, even if those bottles were real, the first half of the first day of tasting, they spit everything out. And so the first bottles that were open were the oldest of the old. And these people are spitting the wine right into the ground because they have to, you know, how are you going to taste 50 wines in a day right. without, you know, passing out? You're not supposed to chug that, people. <laughs> you're not, yeah, no chugging when you're going. No you're chugging when you're, when you're tasting. But um, now that's it, that's actually a good point um, that you bring up about the guy who's bringing the guy around with him. Mm-hmm. And I, okay, so to to bring it back around to crypto, because we have a lot of people in this space going by the term expert. <laughs> and you have a lot of people in the wine industry who are experts but rudy was able to fool them all and you have people here who are claiming to be experts who get sucked into scams like bitconnect and things like that so how much stock do you think people should be putting into the words of these experts i've got four words for you do your own research oh i'm so glad you said that i'm so glad you just said that you cannot (laughs) you know um my first couple couple purchases came off of watching YouTube videos, and I've got two that I that I watch religiously: the Modern Investor and um, Altcoin Daily. And those two are very they're really good for news. They don't they they try not to be um, uh, add too much commentary, especially the Modern Investor. Aside from him just being like, "You're all stupid if you don't believe that Bitcoin is not going to be like a legitimate currency," but um, that was where I learned about Tron. That was where I learned about XRP and about uh, Ethereum and the notion of like the moment that I heard it and the moment I kind of did, you know, did a little bit of searching. It's like, okay, Tron got me for video games because the video game industry is also just chomping at the bit to be part of this digital currency revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, And Ethereum being a smart contract where projects are built on top of it, well, you know, then you have to worry about if the project built on top of it is a scam or not. But regardless of if it's a scam or not, if it's running on Ether, it's utilizing that coin. So the value of that coin is being affected by all the projects. Some of them are going to go, a lot of them are going to go away. Mm-hmm. Tron is trying to do the same thing. That it's it's being, there. the projects are being built and run off of the Tron network. And whether you, you know, Justin Sun, the creator of Tron, whatever you think of him is one thing, but it's like from an investment perspective and doing your own research to decide if this is a, a um, something that you want to take the risk in because anything we're again, like you said, we're not a, a financial advisors and you know, it's all educational purposes only, but anything that you're actually going to invest in or buy in, you should know what you're investing in. You right. should know what these projects are. Who are the people behind it? Right. You know, what, what have they, have, have they been known to be scam artists? You know, right. like, um, be, but at the same time, I did some private equity uh, work back in the day. And I, if, there's this thing called a private placement memorandum. Mm-hmm. And it's only, I, I learned about accredited investors back then. And if you don't know what an accredited investor is, um, it's somebody that has a million dollars in net worth and or makes 200, I think it's either 200 or $250,000 a year. If that's not you, you can't even take advantage of these investments. And that's, in my opinion, that's another slight on the middle class because let's just say 
that your best friend or somebody that you grew up with has this amazing project and they're trying to get investors and you could buy in for $30,000 and that investment is going to be the, the next big thing, right? right? You as Mr. Non-accredited investor can't even jump into it because you, you, you aren't allowed. The SEC is trying to protect you. Mm-hmm. But then to flip that on its head, that private placement memorandum, and one of the things that I had to talk to people on the phone to try to invest, get them to invest in our company was the more times you see the word risk in a private place memorandum, the more money you're going to make. It's, it's only like look for risk because we're, we're trying to explain to you how risky the investment is. And that's because also with private placements, there's no SEC regulation aside from you have to be an accredited investor, right? So those investments, and they, they use them a lot in films, they go to zero all the time. And it's like, well, you just lost $30,000, you know? Um, that's where it's it's uh, kind of losing my train of thought of the the, the crypto side of it, but um, it's it's well actually to to bring it full circle. You don't have to be an accredited investor to buy Bitcoin, to buy into these cryptocurrencies, but you are assuming a, a significant amount of risk when you're buying any investment per se. But uh, when it gets into crypto, you're the the risk is higher. You know. Well, with crypto, you're actually assuming all of the risk. yeah right i mean there's nobody to cry to and that's why when these people talk about suing the you know like when people sued the or tried to sue the people who did bitconnect it's like who who are you gonna sue (laughs) you know and you didn't do your research and you lost some money just take it as a learning experience and go about your day you know and it just people I don't know. I guess w- w- everybody wants to be libertarian anarcho capitalists until they get taken advantage of. Of course, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And they want to run to the government. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, sorry. you know, that's you it, that here. That's where again, it's uh, it's kind of it's it's interesting that um, you bring up that point of you know wanting to. So actually, uh, the idea of not investing more than you can afford to lose. Yes. And that's that crazy story back in 2017 when the guy put like fifty thousand dollars of Bitcoin on a credit card. You opened up a line of credit and bought all of this Bitcoin, and then turned around. And he's like, on top of the fact that he's paying interest on the on the credit card, now his investment just tanked, and you know that guy's up the creek. Right. Um, you you want to be safe about investing and being diversified. And it's now is a really great time to talk about how uh, this the, the market is so, it's acting like Bitcoin right now. It, the swings are like stupid. Like I I, uh, I was looking at it this morning. It, it opened up like down 800 points. The stock market, uh, the Nasdaq, the S and P, they're all getting hit really really hard. Yeah. Um, you would you don't want to have you don't want to have all of your ducks or eggs in one basket. Well, you know, no, and that's, true. that's what I, that's what is a conversation that that I'd like to have uh, for a second is that I'm surprised, and then I'm not because the more that I I, I look into it, it's not going to happen overnight. But this is what I was waiting for, and and it's it's sad to say, but it's like the the market crash is the speculation is people are gonna they're gonna take their money out and they're gonna go into some other vehicle, right. be it the metals or. Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. And the fact that that's not happening is very interesting to me because that means that there is a lot of floating cash out there because it's not, it's not, it's, it's being sucked out, but where is it going? Is it, it, and my, my theory is that it's going into the mattress. People are, Warren Buffett is sitting on more cash than he's ever sat on in his life. Right. And I bet you it's driving him crazy because he wants his money to be making, to be working for him. And it's not in that form. Yeah. And, and you, the, the other piece is the moment you start understanding or learning about cryptocurrency, you have to learn about money. It's like a necessity. It's, it's an inevitable thing. Mm. I didn't really understand inflation until I started learning about Bitcoin. And the idea that since 1914, I think it was when the, when the, the central banks or the, the Fed was created, our dollar is worth 4% of what it was back then. Yeah. And that is crazy talk and, and quantitative easing. Everybody always talks about it. And I was always like, oh yeah, QE, QE, but I never really understood it of like, what exactly is it until maybe about two months ago 
when I was like, exactly what is, what does it mean? What does quantitative easing mean? Mm -hmm. And it's literally when the Fed goes through and prints money. Yeah. And back in October, they printed $85 billion to put into the system to or basically to protect the stock market from what's happening right now. And they're, and they're doing it right now. They're, right. they're printing money. Every time they do that, your, the, the dollars that are sitting in your wallet are being worth less. Yes. Yes. Because there's big, more of it. That's a billion with a B, people. <laughs> yeah. 85 billion. And yesterday I was thinking about it driving to work. It's like, why can't I do that? Why right. can't I just be like, I need more money. I'm just going to go print just $50 million dollars so I can go buy my winery. It's called poetry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but how is it that the Fed can do it and not and and it's not forgery? To so that that side is we're protecting you. Well, we're protecting the yeah. economy. Well, I mean, and and it it's it kind of goes into the whole question of of is your government being responsible with the currency that they're issuing? And yeah. by and large, we could pretty much say no. They're not being responsible. And unfortunately, we're going to see that more and more as this current issue continues. We're not going to name the issue because I don't want to get this video taken down. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, you're seeing a lot of panic out there, and a lot of it's because of that. And like you said, people are putting their money into the mattress. And you have a lot of people blaming the current dip in, the, in crypto on this plus coin. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? So my thing is, okay, we're using that as the excuse for this one, but what's it going to be next time? People are taking their money and they're taking their Bitcoin, they're selling it, and they're holding on to the cash. And yeah. that's going to be the, the, just the way of doing things until, I, I guess, uh, and for people listening, I'm doing air quotes, everything gets back to normal. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and that being said, that everything gets back to normal, we're, we're up against a gigantic moment in Bitcoin in May, which is the halving, where everything gets cut in half. And the, 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 the speculation, the idea is that that's going to push the price of Bitcoin up really high. I'm curious to know or to see whether that's actually going to play out now or if, it's, if we're not going to see this kind of like gigantic push into bitcoin because that's that's deflation that's actually the opposite of what the fed does of like pr printing more money mm -hmm. they're the, the miners are going to be rewarded for with half of the of the of the amount that they are right now and so that's going to automatically create less bitcoin into the market i i came across some information probably about a month ago too that that i didn't think about until um until i read it that the miners they mine the bitcoin and then they set they put it right on the market they're not they're not mining bitcoin to like hoard it oh. they're making they're trying to make a living and right. so it's like every time that they're that 10 minute and they actually get it which is another crazy aside that 90 percent of the mining rigs that are out there sucking the, the electricity to do it will never see a bitcoin They'll never actually get a reward, which is mind boggling in itself, because I've seen the pictures of these warehouses mm. where it's like you think 10 percent of them are actually going to re reap the reward of mining the Bitcoin. The other 90 percent, it's a it's a wasted money. money. It's like and, and these ASICs that some gamer is like, why is it getting so expensive? I can't buy my my graphics card because people are using it to mine Bitcoin. Um, it's it, it's. It's crazy to me to think about it from that perspective, but it's again, it's the rabbit hole. It's like as you dig deeper and deeper, it's like all there's so many things to look at and see, and 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 think about, and rationalize. And so once it gets into the miners, the miners are a whole different ball of wax, and the 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 difficulty and all the different ways that that the the program and the the programming of Bitcoin makes it really really hard from a money perspective you know it's just yeah. I, I i again i i i i love the tech like I, I i'd say you know coming back to like wanting that money so i can go buy a winery but i've learned so much in the last two years by studying bitcoin that or cryptocurrencies in general that it's like i'm so glad that i took that plunge mm -hmm. because it's the same thing with wine i am so glad that i caught the wine bug 12 years ago 
because to me before that it was a very complicated intimidating bottle of wine that was sitting there on a list that i had to try to sell right. and it's like uh, i don't even know anything about it right. but then the thing that got me for wine was the marketing side it's like each different bottle is basically you know it it has one job to do it, the job is for it to be sold and drink you know and once you get there it's like okay what how does it how does it do that? Is is it Charles Shaw dollar not two you know two buck chuck or now two forty nine and I think the price went back down again. <laughs> but is it is it this bottle that's just supposed to be like bought by somebody so that they can drink it with their dinner or is this a a two thousand dollar bottle of Chateau Petrus that's being opened for a graduation or being sold at this you know at a at a super hoity toity restaurant right. so that somebody can drink the label you know it's uh it's it's ah. I'm sorry. I rant. I get, I go on tangents and uh, no, that was funny about like this, this whole interview that it's like, we really kind of just got going with it, but. Um, no, this uh, is great. This is great. And, and you, you, you actually added a lot to, for me to think about um, because, you know, and it goes back to the whole do your own research thing. And, and quite frankly, this, this do your own research isn't just for finance. Do your own research is for a lot of things. You know, buying a car requires you to do your own research. You know, and yeah. people don't understand how important it is to not take people's word for stuff because people will scam you. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of snake charmers out there. There are a lot. I mean, and this isn't new. I mean, the, I, and, and, and this is where my defense of crypto and Bitcoin comes into play. Because for everyone who says Bitcoin is used for crime or Bitcoin is used for this and that, I can give you a hundred stories where the United States dollar is used for that too. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that, that it's like, if I wanted to hire a hitman or buy drugs, I'm going to go and I'm going to get $25,000 or whatever the price tag is of that. And I'm going to go meet some guy in an alley or in a parking lot or whatever. And I'm going to make that transaction. Mm -hmm. And as long as those bills aren't marked and somebody's not already following me, you know, up to, up to, aware that I'm up to no good mm. that cash transaction is done and nobody even knew about it it's right. it's all over right. where it's in, and that's where it starts to get interesting too about something that I learned about the ten thousand dollar thing mm. I never really understood that why is it that if I take nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars out of my bank right. account yeah I don't even have to there's no paperwork the moment right. you get to ten thousand dollars it's like what is this money being used for what you know, I want i KYC right. and AML all of a sudden starts coming out. Know your customer and anti-money laundering uh, uh, regulations that it's like at that point, then it is, how, you know, you have to figure out how you get that $25,000 in cash to go do that illicit activity. But that's the easiest way to be anonymous because, you know, and that's even more when you watch movies and it's like, I want it in small unmarked bills. That's, that's, that's exactly that. what that is, <laughs> what that you is. know? And it's like, <laughs> It's crazy to, to again, to kind of, you know, wrap your mind around that notion that it, it we're, the, the masses are being scared out of crypto yes. because they think that it's used for just Silk Road stuff. Right. You know? It's just used for crime. Well, that's like that on CNBC the other day. And the guy was like, they were asking him about Bitcoin. And he was like, well, I'm not a drug dealer, so I wouldn't know anything about it. And I'm like, what? the hell yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> like are you serious right now <laughs> yeah and the panel just laughed i'm like no call him on that Do what about the other one uh, uh i i saw it on a clip on twitter that it was like they were asked they were talking about bitcoin and the guy's like i have what's the difference between that and venmo i could just venmo somebody the money it's like you don't get it man you don't get you it just at all. don't <laughs> understand the only okay now Here's the thing, and I've had to explain Bitcoin to a person who has no idea what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. like at all. So I basically explain it as, okay, imagine you're trying to buy something from me and you're using your credit card, but instead of your credit card going to Visa to validate your transaction, it goes straight between you and me. And or think about it as PayPal without PayPal sitting in the middle, you know, something like that. I would say that to a person who has no idea what I'm talking about, but I am not going to go on CNBC 
MB, uh, CNN, Fox News Business, and say something like that. Because yeah. it's way more, it's way more complicated than that. Yeah. But we have people who don't care to begin with talking about this. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it is just, it, it just rattles my brain. I'm just like, why? <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, it's, it's, you have to wonder how much of it is the, the almost like um, scr scripted. Yes. How much of it is like, you know, like, like just straight out saying, I'm, I don't buy drugs or I'm not a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. Drugs is a big word. It's, it's like, word. oh, it, yes. exactly. It's, a, it's yes. that thing of like, well, and, and for, the again the average american citizen that gets that that just gets fed all the information that they need and and thinks that the media is is on their side and telling the truth all of the time that it's it's like well they said it so obviously it's not you know how many how many people listen to warren buffett religiously right and that guy being like it's uh, you know it's what was it uh, uh rat poison on steroids <laughs> like that <laughs> like okay, I, I Warren. don't know what that is, Warren, but okay. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the, the thing is, and, and this is why what Pomp said in, in regards to that, the whole thing that he said, is, you know, I'll listen to Warren Buffett on traditional stock information. I'm not going to listen to him on technology because yeah. that's not his field. Yep. You know, I'll listen to now. You, if you want me to go listen to uh, Tim, um, what's the the guy in front of, uh, in charge of Apple? Um, uh, Tim Cook. Tim Cook. If you yeah. want me to listen to Tim Cook about technology, you better believe I'm going to pay attention. Yeah, that's what he does. You know. You know that's it. Would it would be an, another, we could another rabbit hole conversation of <laughs> of the the technology and the way that the Moore's law and another law, I can never remember the name of it, but basically these two laws working together mm. are making everything faster and cheaper. Yeah. And the faster and cheaper and the exponential movement of it, I'm gonna, um, I think that I read this a long time ago, unless I was one that kind of like conceptualized it, but I don't think I did. Um, the day that the internet was born, there was an electronic fence that was put in your front yard, right? Mm. And that moment, you could you didn't even know it was there you know it's like you could walk over it and it's all good but every time that the internet like kind of went through a moore's law and this other law of the doubling effect that fence doubled in size and as it goes from one inch to two inch to four inch to eight inch to 16 to 30 yeah if you think about it now that electronic fence is a mile high and every time that it's going to double again it's going to go from one to two and when you think about the, the, everybody talking about you know the roaring 20s 2020 to 2030 as long as this market doesn't slow it down which i, I don't think you can stop computers mm -hmm. but we're gonna see evolution or, or, or um innovations and things that we didn't even see coming because of artificial intelligence because of machine learning and and people like warren buffett they were raised in a different time and and one of the other just as my you know have a baby coming along that you know everybody always says it's like listen to your parents because that when you grow up you'll realize that they were right and they were like you know I, I i've been through this i i know what you're going through i would argue that they don't that now we live in a different world and somebody mentioned something to me the other day that was like ah like this little moment where i stopped in my tracks any kid that's born right now is going to have a cell phone in their hand probably by the time they're under 10 like 10 is, is yeah. where it's like, it's already, you're late, right? Yeah, you're late. So when you get there, when we were growing up, we had to call our friend's house and the mom and dad, mom or dad answered the phone. And if they were responsible parents, they're like, who are you? What, you know, what, what you know, they would, they would kind of probe us mm -hmm. and they would, they would interrogate, you know, friendly interrogation. But it's like, before I'm going to let you, especially if you're going to be dating the daughter, you know, whatever, yeah. they want to know about you. Right. Now there are people, there are kids that the parents don't even know who their friends are because they're just calling directly to their cell phone. Exactly. That that barrier doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. When you think about bullying and you think about the the influence that kids have with social media and everything else, our parents were not we weren't raised with that. Right. So 
we live in a different world now. And from a technological perspective, the way that things are happening so quickly, it's making people's heads spin literally. And, you know, that's where it's, again, like you were saying, we can listen to Tim Cook, but we probably don't want to listen to old crony money and cronies that, that don't even have the time and, and specifically don't have the patience to want to learn the technology. And that's where it's like, it's kind of scary. Yes. Right. And we're going to leave it there because I don't think we can go down too many more rabbit holes. <laughs> <laughs> but to your point about do your own research, everyone, if you're listening to this, please, please, please do your own research. Nothing that Jeremy or I are saying right now should be taken as financial advice. Nothing you re- see on YouTube should be taken as financial advice. You have to do what's best for you and your own money and your own family situation. Please do your own research. It's, it's, I can't stress that enough. Please do your own research. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you. Thank you for having me on. I, I, I enjoyed the talk and, uh, and I look forward to, to listening to more of your podcasts.